<laughs> well, I, I think we're there. Uh, uh, hello, welcome back. <laughs> a little bit later than uh, I was hoping, but well, we, we have an hour to work with. We'll just run back and, and we'll cut it, and the folks that aren't here live will never know the difference. It could happen. It's been two weeks. It's hard to believe. Time goes so fast. Uh, I am completely stuffed up in, in my sinuses, simultaneously incredibly stuffed and incredibly dry. So hopefully uh, I can get through this uh, without losing my breath and, and so forth. We'll see what happens. Uh, uh, this is the last T-Tuesday update until December 7th, uh, taking November off to, well, partly to work on the grid, but also just to do other stuff that has been waiting and waiting and waiting. So what this uh, episode is going to be mostly about is resilience and robustness in the L2 plate stuff. That's what I've been working on for the last couple of weeks, and there's uh, been a, a lot of progress. And, you know, to me, coming up on the November break, the feeling is is that, you know, the story of the summer and the fall, anyway, uh, of 2021, as far as the T2 tile project goes, it's about plate and about L2 plate uh, that are, you know, they're they're clunky and obvious and and. and non-organic looking uh, and all of the things that that we know about that but you know it's, it seems to me absolutely the best shot we've had so far on the path to utility that we could actually build up stuff to do that and part of doing that is to try to take seriously robust first that you know we can't just say yeah yeah we'll care about fault tolerance but not actually deal with it so two weeks ago uh i was x-raying uh some of the face plants and so forth uh, i'm sorry two episodes ago a month ago now and that's what i'm also doing here today so uh, um you know, when you say you're going to allow non-determinism, when you're going to allow errors, the temptation is to just say, well, the only errors that I'm going to allow are going to be ones uh, that, you know, are independent, random, single bits flipping and so forth. That's not what we have. We already have at least four categories of uh, different kinds of errors, you know, an atom being cleanly erased, leaving the site empty. Uh, that's the easiest uh, kind of failure we deal with. Uh, packet drops, uh, simulating what goes wrong or what may go wrong, we're still not sure, uh, between the actual T2 tiles. Cosmic rays is just, you know, bits flipping in the background, no reason, no rhyme or reason, random numbers as far as we know. X-ray bursts is focused stuff that may actually have some, you know, space-time uh, coherence to it. Uh, uh, in all cases, the goal of the computation is first, dynamically preserve its pattern. That's, you know, for the A-Life folks, that's the definition of life that we use, uh, that, well, that, you know, that I offer for uh, the, a take on uh, how to get uh, artificial and, li and natural living systems together. And the process is blast the system until it does something wrong, try to figure out why it did something wrong, see if we can't fix it and go around again. Uh, uh, this uh, cartoon from uh, Jeremy, the hand-waving comic, came by on Twitter uh, a few days ago. This is about what my uh, last two weeks have been like on the left, you know, and nobody actually wants to see that. Uh, uh, but I did do something that I did... Uh, in the very beginning, uh, 2018, in the early days of the T2 Tile Project, I started a script that does a screenshot once a minute, day and night, uh, uh, ever since a week ago Monday. Uh, um, and... Uh, uh, just to kind of get a flavor of the mess of the whole thing. And, and we're going to try to take a look at it real quick here, you know, with things being kind of confused. We'll see how this goes, but...
not actually going to uh, do that. We're going to just do the version on the right where we just dip our toes in and have a little simulation of all of the uh, false starts. So that was the idea. I started out using the x-ray tool that we saw in the uh, opening demo uh, where you can just go in and you know, like use the airbrush to uh, spray faults, spray bit flips onto it and, and seeing what happens. So those yellow black uh, lines are uh, sites that uh, upon loading them uh, it turned out there was a, uh, a parity error, error, error correcting code detected a problem and that's what causes those things to show up uh, um, and you know there also can be uh, bit flips that lead to problems that aren't detected by the error correcting code uh, um, and that's of course just the beginning of the entire can of worms that we have to deal with but you know they reap they they clean up remarkably well and and my goal in doing L2 plates was really to, to do larger scale stuff, but they've proved, you know, extremely resilient at the level of reestablishing the L2 plate itself. Now, a lot of times, you know, the content, the L1 plates inside each L2 site get lost when an inconsistency is developed, is discovered and the, the L2 site gets erased and rebuilt and it's going to have to recreate itself. So, you know, this is not any kind of magic. This is not just preserving everything magically. This is, let's keep the L2 plate structure intact as best we can, dynamically preserve its pattern, and then have L1's guys deal with, you know, well, maybe they could have some redundancy in neighboring things and they could transfer some information in. So there's an example. I don't know if you can actually see it, you know, right down here where there's a little extra uh, L2 plate because the thing is coming out a little bit too small, but it cleans itself up and that's the typical of what sort of did. So I would just hit it with more x-rays until it did something that was wrong. So this is an example of something that goes actually wrong. Now we've got an L1 plate that's got no L2 plate around it at all and no L2 plate in within reach uh, able to reseed it. And then the L2 plate off somewhere else. This didn't go anywhere. This one was a trapping state. This was a failure. And what I would see a lot of is is uh, L2 plates, uh, L2 plates spawning off extra L2 sites that really shouldn't have been there. And I, I, I looked through that, uh, and eventually, you know, I got it down to a specific case here that, you know, it's supposed to be three by three. So, so that X should be a three there and not a, a seven, but it had a bit flip. It had the, the four bit flipped from a zero to a one, which turned a three into a seven. And that's what it's doing. Uh, uh and so the next plate over still thinks it's a three by three but this l2 site thinks it's a seven by three and this is one of the tricky states where that error actually leads to a legal configuration in terms of the plate relationships uh, uh, the seven by three plate says I contain you, your entire three by three, you're just inside of me. And, you know, in fact, when the error first happened, it was only in one L2 site that was that was claiming this. And if it had truly been a seven by three containing plate, it would have been in all of the L2 sites along that edge. And it wasn't, but the L, uh, the other side had no way of knowing that locally speaking, it just says, okay, that looks like a plate that's containing me. Uh, um, so no act, no actual error when it was looking from one L2 site to another, but uh, as you know, I, I messed with it some more and it recovered some more and it regrew and respawned from one side to the other and so on. Same thing would happen if it had been cosmic rays happening rather than me actually messing with it. But an interesting thing happened is that, you know, they were both sides, the 7-3 plate and the 3-3 plate were trying to um, uh, uh, regrow. Well, the, the seven by three, the, the, the seven by threes, and the three three as that, and as a result, eventually, where does it happen here? Yeah, right here. That eventually, in the same plate. So now we're in a single L two site, and we're looking at adjacent L two. Well, one L2 plate, we're looking at adjacent atoms. And now one of them says, my L2 information says um, I'm part of a three by three L2 plate. The other one says I'm part of a seven by three L2 plate. That's an inconsistency. All the L2 atoms of a single L2 site should agree on the size of the plate and their location in the plate. So this is where an inconsistency is detected or, well, it wasn't detected, uh, but it turned out to 
to be fairly easy to write another little bit of code uh, to say if you know we are on the same plate so there's me and there's a the other thing that I'm, I'm looking to say are we consistent so if we are on the same plate in an L1 sense which means we're in the same L2 site then we ought to have the same uh, 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 my size uh, why don't I just use this thing uh, uh, does that here we go so my size uh, should be the same as a size my position on the L2 plate should be the same as L2's position and so forth and if not we have detected an inconsistency and we return true now what actually happens when we detect an inconsistency okay we found it but how do you know which one is right one says three three one says seven three how do you tell uh, uh, because you know it could be either, especially when you just have a little teeny peephole view. The answer that I've been adopting more and more as I go forward that I like pretty well is whoever discovers the inconsistency assumes they're right. They have <laughs> their self-confidence and they tell the other side to die. Yeah, uh, and, you know, in fact, they don't really tell it. They set the death bits on the thing to initiate the death cascade on the other side. Uh, um, the problem with this, right, is, you know, which side happens to discover the inconsistency depends on whether the 3-3 three, three atom gets an event before the 7-3 atom or vice versa. And that's random by the design of the machine. So how are we going to have any sense of knowing whether the right person, the right site, the, tr the, the right answer is going to win? And the answer to that is we don't know. Uh, uh, but over time, the odds favor the locally consistent choice. And, and that, you know, it, it's, it's been kind of a, a joy for me that <laughs> as I work through this and I keep thinking, you know, from a correct and an efficient point of view, well, what I have to do, I've discovered an inconsistency. What I have to do is to get a bigger picture view, you know, look further and further, find out what's going on, take a census, take a vote, send messages uh, to say, you know, am I right or am I wrong? So that I don't make the wrong mistake. But so much better to just say, hey, heck, I'm right. <laughs> Tell the other guy to die. Uh, and if I'm wrong, if I'm not right, then he's part of a locally consistent region that I'm going to run into another one of them soon, and I'm going to have to win a flip against them. And it's the basic thing is that the consistent, as long as we have redundancy, local spatial redundancy, like supplied by the plate, the next guy over, his position on the plate is one bigger than mine. I could compute his position on the plate, but every plate atom records their own position. That's a ton of information. That means that if I have a cosmic ray that comes in and flips one site, that it might be able to take over and convince the whole world that, yes, this is a 7-3 plate, that's the correct answer. But it's going to have to win uh, these showdowns with, I think it's 3-3, three, three. Oh, it's 7-3, okay, I win. Next guy, I think it's 3-3. Three, three. And the odds are the locally consistent choice wins. It's really extremely fundamental and it feels like it's part of the very bottom up nature of the whole thing. I mean, you know, fork bombs are the, that just reproduce as fast as possible are the absolute basic dynamics of these kind of systems. And if you have like a red fork bomb and a blue fork bomb and you plop them both down, they're both expanding as fast as possible. They quickly run into each other and start overwriting each other. And you say, which one is going to win? You know, is it going to end up being all red or is it going to end up being all blue? And, you know, it could go either way, but the basic principle is, you know, you should bet on whichever color has more area right now. Other things being equal, if uh, red is surrounding blue, then uh, it's more likely that blue is going to get go extinct and vice versa if blue has more area. If for this exact reason that the minority has to win more uh, uh, long, longer sequence of battles, even if they're completely random coin flip, uh, uh, in order to actually succeed. And they're just not likely to do it. Could it happen? Sure. Is it likely to happen? Don't bet all your money. So, uh, I've got, you know, that. So, these ideas are some of these things like the 7 3 and the 3 3, where at the L2 plate level, that was a, a, a fault. It was a one bit fault originally, although it did spread for a while before it got wiped out. Uh, um, 
was one of these things where it flipped it into another legal state, a state where the L2 plate was containing another L2 plate and so forth. Same thing, I've, I saw it several times happening with the L1 plate, and I think I have, so you know, here's top of the minute, you can see my thoughts working out over time. Uh, uh, so here's a case where, you know, it, the uh, two of the uh, L2, L1 plates up there aren't filling the L2 plate. Why not? Well, because uh, the plate that they were being reproduced from down below actually consists of a smaller L1 plate and a, a mutated edge that says it's containing that smaller plate. And when the L2 plate spawning process says, let's make a copy of the let's seed the L1 plate from a copy of what I have it seeds whatever size it sees and that's the wrong size to actually fill the plate and those things come out that way and once again you know we could say that um, every L1 plate should completely fill the L2 plate and then this could be detected as an inconsistency and something could be done about it about it but this is a trade-off and you know my feeling is is that maybe we want to have complex L1 plate relationships which are then surrounded by an L2 plate so we're not going to necessarily be able to detect whether this is right or wrong uh, uh, just based on local information and this goes to the fundamental principle of this whole thing that you know allowing so L1 plates to be nested in various ways and then have an L2 plate puts around them is much more flexible than just saying the L1 plate has to completely fill the L2 plate or it's inconsistent. Uh, um, and But that flexibility, that ability to be more programmable means there are more legal states that can be confused that you can have some type some you know cosmic rays x-ray burst whatever it happens to be uh, uh, that messes things up and takes us not to an inconsistent state but for a consistent state of a program that we're not running and in general what we would like to do is be as inflexible as possible be as hard-coded as we can get away with given for, uh, that we're down in this very low level stuff and we want it to be all strong for my money the key point is that exalting universal programmability is it's almost criminal because what that means is is that you know there's this unbelievable myriad of legal programs nearby and when we get beyond just cosmic rays flipping random bits and we get to malice then we can leap to one of those other states one of those other legal programs trivially all right uh, uh so I fixed up uh, a couple of those problems, like putting in that little bit of extra code. Uh, uh, and then I also had this one where the, <laughs> the, uh, the simulator crashed when I had background cosmic rays going and I was looking at Twitter or sleeping or whatever it was, I would come back and the, the engine itself had crashed. And it actually took quite a while to run down for mm, good reasons and bad. Uh, uh, oh, and, and, and by the way, just for the record, uh, um, I changed. So the cosmic rays, the way that they originally were working up until a couple of days ago, was when an atom was being written back from an event into the tile storage, it had a one in a hundred, one percent chance of being corrupted. And if that one was chosen on a 1% chance, then each bit of it had a 1% chance of being flipped. So a 1% chance of being chosen for corruption and then a 1% chance per bit of a flip. And I've now changed that to one in a thousand. So uh, it's, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time it will be written back uh, faithfully, but that remaining 0.1% of the time it'll be corrupted and when it is corrupted it'll be a one percent error and you know what it boils down to is like just like the, the mouthwash you know it says 99.9 percent .9 of germs are killed you know and there's plenty left <laughs> you know 99.9 .9, not such a, a gigantic number really one in a thousand there's still tons of uh errors that are happening in this thing the problem and, and you know and most people that are studying fault tolerance they're talking at errors of the one in a million one in a billions you know much much smaller than this this is really quite aggressive but at one in a hundred the three by three l2 tiles would sometimes they you know they would just get wiped out just by bad luck so i wanted them to have a chance of surviving so i did back it off uh, uh 
all these stuff I've been through. Uh, um, I'm not going to no, taking too much time, so I'm going to skip it. Here's another one where it grew a little extra, a uh, little, you know, uh, webbing between two of them. Uh, uh, and eventually I managed to figure out what was causing the uh, simulator to crash. It was terrible because I would leave it running uh, with background errors for like hours and hours and it was fine. Uh, uh, but then I would come in and I would mess around and, and start ex investigating what's going on and 20 minutes later it would crash. And what it was was look up at, at Ulam element type from Adam. That's the fundamental low level thing where he says tell me what the class is, what code I need to run for this particular atom. And at that low level, the atom is supposed to be consistent. It's supposed to have been error checked, ready to go. And that code is not ready to deal with it being uh, inconsistent, being messed up. Uh, uh, and why are we calling lookup atom element type from atom? We're calling it because we want to find out what color the atom is. Well, that's what we use every time we're drawing it. But in this case, we're calling to find out what color it is, not in order to draw it on the screen, but for an atom view panel. It's we're trying to figure out that blue color, uh -uh, like that. And that drawing of the atom view panel was done in a separate place in the code than the drawing of the tiles, so there was nothing catching that error. That was the problem. So we have fixed that up, uh, uh, fixed a whole bunch of other things. And as we saw in the opener, I'm just going to do this relative, I'll take a couple of minutes to do a demo and then we'll wrap up since we did start late. Uh, uh, <coughs> um, you know, I, I always imagine that things will go much faster than it was. And, you know, I wanted to get the L2 plates moving, uh, uh, so move this machine, and they're still not moving. Uh, um, but, you know, all of this robustness stuff was worth it, uh, taking the time to, to pound it all out, because, you know, this seems like the, the, the absolute uh, basic stuff that we're going to be building on, and we, we want to, number one, make it as solid as we can, and number two, we want to understand it quite exquisitely. So feeling good about that. But if we want to make things move, we need to be able to coordinate at a whole L2 plate level. And just like we did on the L1 plate, one way to do that is to do a rock, paper, scissors uh, sort of thing to coordinate. You know, the upper left changes color and that flows down to the bottom right and then the bottom right changes color back and it flows back up and down. But doing that at the L2 plate level is new in this update. Uh, uh, so let's see if we can uh, do a demo here. All right. So uh, what is that? A seed. All right. I think that's right. So, okay. So this is a, uh, a RGB sync uh, uh, demo. So it doesn't do anything except uh, it's an L1 plate and it's going back and forth. So once the upper left is green, uh, <coughs> it changes blue, uh, uh, and once the lower right is red, it changes green, like that. And we go back and forth, uh, and this is very nice. Uh, um, but we can mess it up, uh, because that's part of the game here. Uh, uh, unlike, you know, and again, this is a, v a variant of the... Uh, basic trick that's long been known in cellular automata fields about a way to put the uh, synchronous stuff on top of asynchronous stuff. This is the classic one but it's related uh, and you know as I uh, repeatedly emphasized when talking to people that throw that result in my face saying oh there's no reason to do uh, uh, asynchronous cellular automata because we can always uh, lay a synchronous one on top of it and do that well that's only true if there's never any errors and so if we come in here and uh, uh, see it survived uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we will mess this up uh, uh, Whoops, see, I killed the whole thing. Uh, uh, now, in a way, uh, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of stacking the deck against myself because uh, this particular thing, you know, let me just, just put some x-rays onto this and let it go for a second. All right, uh, uh, um, so 
so you see that kind of grayish color in there. So there's in the classic synchronous on top of asynchronous, there's just three states, which we make RB red, green, and blue. Uh, here we have a fourth one, which is sort of like an initialized state that we go into in certain conditions when something's gone wrong. And so that's part of why, I wiped out again, part of why it's actually able to uh, survive a lot of the messing around I'm doing with it. Uh, um, it's doing really well, uh, uh, which, <laughs> all right, well, maybe we won't be able to do it. So, you know, this is so sort of, uh, uh, praising with fake dams, I guess. Uh, um, maybe if I just draw some, uh, RGB sinks in there somewhere, uh, uh, where are they? What if I, uh, oh, that was inconsistent too. Well, maybe I won't be able to show it. Uh, um, uh, uh, cause the, uh, <laughs> did the job too well. Uh, um, well, it turns out, well, I, I suppose we could do it. Well, why don't we do that? We'll, we'll, we'll try to do, a uh, an actual L2 plate demo instead. Uh, uh, oops. All right. Ah, okay. So there we go. So this one actually locked up just right out of the bat, out of the bat, uh, because it's got this weird uh, little case that the solid entire plate doesn't have, uh, and so the L2 plate has to jump. Uh, uh, the the color signals have to jump from one L1 L2 site to another, and that means they have very limited communication, and they can get into places where they don't know what's going on, and they end up locking up. So if I get rid of these by hand, uh, uh, there we go. Okay, so now that should finish, and then cycle back uh, uh, like that. Uh, um, so this is nice. It, it, it works well. Uh, uh, but if we turn on uh, background errors, rights fault, where is that? That's behind here. Whoops. Uh, I turn on rights fault here. Uh, um, it won't be long before we will manage to get uh, the RGB sync into a state where it stops cycling because it reaches an illegal state. Now, again, I've done a bunch of work in the last several days uh, uh, to make this more robust than it was out of the box, and I have ideas about how to make it still more robust, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I want to make it more symmetrical. You know how it is. Let's turn these back off. Uh, uh, okay. So now it's messed up again, but we can do surgery and get it going if we just get rid of those. And so part of the problem is, is that the, uh, when red is heading down, it's got this buffer of blue, but when green is heading back up, it's right against, uh, red. And so I want to introduce a fourth state like yellow that will go between green and red when it's going up and blue will go between green and red when it's going down. There still can be additional, um, uh, inconsistencies that won't magically fix everything, but it will help. Uh, um, so, so this is pretty good. I feel, I feel good about this. Uh, um, and that, that'll be the, the demo that we wanted to do. Uh, uh, so, all right, that's it. Uh, um, uh, in November, I want to make progress on building the damn grid. Uh, I, I think a fair goal is to have the grid all assembled in 2021. It, it may all be working. It may be working to some degree. It remains to be seen, but the thing will be built and we'll find out if it's not being not, not running, we'll have more information as to why. So we're going to have a camera, a, a better camera. I ordered it. It should be coming in in the next week. Uh, that's going to hopefully get us much, much better uh, pictures uh, of the running grid than we see during the waiting room, for example, here, uh, and so on. And we'll be go just going from there. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Uh, um, so that is it. I don't know what the heck happened uh, with the camera when I started up. It, it's a different camera, uh, um, but step by step. We've also got a new workstation, a more powerful workstation with a better graphics card and so forth that is going to be coming in. Uh, well, we've got it that uh, 
by the next T Tuesday update, I want that to be running all of this. We'll see how it goes. I hope you're going, uh, uh, you're doing all right. Thanks so much for checking in whenever you manage to, to get, <laughs> come around to see these incredibly nerdy uh, uh, little progress reports. Uh, uh, I feel okay. Uh, uh, I feel like, you know, uh, it was fun uh, uh, finding these cases and discovering, hey, there's a pretty easy way that I could actually catch that and watching the, the L2 plate getting more and more resilient as a process. That's it. Uh, uh, I will see you in December. Uh, have a good November. That's it.